All right, let's conclude our series. How many of you enjoyed Samson? Yeah? Some things you probably didn't know. You know, it's interesting when we get into the Word of God, we, we start to see some layers to people that we hadn't seen in the past. And some of our heroes, uh, when we peel back enough layers, can look like heels, right? Not just heroes, but heels. And, and Samson, as you know, has a very complicated narrative, but let's continue as we close out this series on spiritual strength. Um, when we started the series, we learned about the spiritual insight of his mom, um, who was nameless, who was able to see things that her husband, Manoah, could not see. Uh, she trusted the character of God, knew that God did not want them dead and that he was trusting them with a gift, the gift of Samson, who would be a deliverer from the Philistines. After 40 years of rule, uh, God said enough is enough, and uh, he sent a deliverer, a Messiah type in Samson, who was a Nazarite. And because of this Nazarite vow, he could not cut his hair. He could not, he could not drink wine. There were a number of rules that he had to follow along with following the law of Moses. And this is what set him apart and made him special. And we learn what Samson did with that strength in chapter 14 and also chapter 15. We realize that even though God can bless us with spiritual gifts, those spiritual gifts can be used to harm and to hurt. Not help, but to harm and to hurt. And we were challenged that anytime God blesses us with a spiritual gift, that we make it a point that we are going to be helpful. Not harmful, right? Not hurtful, but helpful. And last week, we learned that even though God was willing to allow Samson to misuse his gifts, that God was willing did not make it his will. You remember that distinction? That God was willing, willing to allow us to misuse our gifts and misuse our freedom of choice that does not make it God's will. And so we come to even a more complicated part of Samson's narrative. When we closed out in chapter 15, it says that Samson had ruled, had ruled for 20 years, which is interesting because many of the judges ruled for longer periods of time. But it says that Samson ruled for 20 years. He judged for 20 years in, in Israel. It's almost as if his story had come to an end, but there needed to be one more addition, and that is chapter 16. So that's where we find ourselves. Chapter 16 of Judges, starting with verse 1, it says, one day... Samson went to Gaza. Well, that, that feels very current, doesn't it? Believe it or not, this is the same Gaza we speak of, at least a portion of it. Samson went to Gaza where he saw a prostitute. He went in to spend the night with her to play Monopoly. The people of Gaza were told, Samson is here. So they surrounded the place and lay in wait to him all night at the city gate. They made no move during the night, saying, at dawn we'll kill him. But Samson lay there only until the middle of the night. Then he got up and took hold of the doors of the city gate, together with the two posts, tore them loose, bar and all. He lifted them to his shoulders and carried them to the top of the hill that faces Ebron. Sometime later... Sometime later, he fell in love with a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. What a pretty name. The rulers, the rulers of the Philistines went to her and said, See if you can lure him into showing you the secret of his great strength and how we can overpower him so we may tie him up and subdue him. Each one of us will give you eleven hundred shekels of silver. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for trusting us again with your word. May we be challenged by it. May we be convicted. And may we be willing to move forward with more spiritual vigor and strength. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So first of all, I just want to acknowledge Samson was a strong dude. <laughs> I mean, rips apart the city gates, just carries them on his shoulders. Including, including the post. I mean, this man 
had superhuman strength. Before the mutants, before someone came from Krypton, there was Samson. Before someone uh, was in a radioactive accident and turned green when he got angry, there was Samson. Samson, super strength. And if you notice, the enemies of Samson, the Philistines, they're choosing to ensnare him a little bit differently. It, it's, it's similar, but it's not exactly the same. They're still wanting to talk to his woman to have influence over him, right? Wasn't that similar to remember his first kind of wife, fiance, wasn't completely, you know, uh, uh, the ceremony wasn't completely finished, but he still saw her as his wife. Remember what happened to her? Remember the threats that the Philistines made when he, 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 he gave a riddle and said, if you can't solve it, then you owe me this amount of money? And they said to his fiance at the time, if you do not find out his secret, we will burn you alive. But what happened when they actually made good on that, when they did burn her, she and her father alive? What happened? What did Samson do? He went Hulk on them, right? He says, now I have a right to really get even with you. So they got to the point where they realized that inflicting violence was only going to make Samson more violent, all right? They, they, they realize that, that every time we up the ante, every time we get violent, he gets more violent. And his violence always looks worse than ours. So we're not going to be violent this time. Let's see if we can coax his new girlfriend. Hey, girl, we know you've been looking at that Chanel purse. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. So if you, if you do us this solid, we'll make sure you get that Chanel purse. We're going to give you a lot of money, 1,100 shekels of silver. You're going to be set for years. You can probably retire. So they use money this time to entice her and not violence. They don't threaten to burn her. And so this is a really good proposition. Delilah can get out of the slums now. She can, she can set her family up. She can, she can have a future that is stable. And so this is just too good to pass up. So she says to Samson in verse 6, tell me your secret, the secret of your great strength and how you can be tied up and subdued. Now, this doesn't sound like the most appropriate verse in the Bible right now. But this is what she wants. How can I tie you up? And subdue you. And Samson answered her, If anyone ties me up with seven fresh bowstrings that have not been dried, I'll become as weak as any other man. That's, that, that's how you can get me. Now, is this truthful or is this a lie? It's a lie. Samson, yet again, is no upstanding follower of God. He's breaking the law again. Not just his Nazarite vow, he is breaking the Torah. He's giving false testimony. He's lying to her. And so Delilah decides to tie him up with men hidden in the room. She called him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the bowstrings as easily as a piece of string, uh, a piece of string snaps when it comes close to a flame. So the secret of his strength was not discovered. Now, this also makes me a little bit curious. They wanted to know the secret of his strength. Why did they need to know the secret of his strength? In my visual of Samson, I always see him as being really huge, don't you? Don't you see him kind of like, I don't know, six foot four, about my height, six foot four? And uh, no, that could, be, that could be perceived as a lie. I'm not going to do that. 5'10". I just see him with like, like, like one of those, I don't know, bodybuilders, like a He-Man type figure, right? I mean, don't you feel like he, like he works out at 24-hour fitness or LA fitness like all the time? So that when, he, when, when you see him, you'd be like, oh yeah, that bro is strong. Yeah, yeah, you, you know, you work out, bro? You work out? You lift? You lift? Like, it would be obvious but there is a likelihood that Samson didn't look strong. There is a good likelihood that he may have even come off a little scrawny. 
because they know there's something that must be a secret because it for sure is not him working out. And it would just be God to work a miracle like that so that you would know it's not by your strength but by, by his strength, right? So they cannot figure it out. So there is a likelihood Samson is probably not that tall, that Samson doesn't look like he works out. Samson could look like he sits on a couch and watches the prices right, like on reruns, right? Just some of you are like identifying with that. You're like, oh, he's like me. Oh, that's my best friend. So, so, so this, there's just something to be said here. So Delilah has, you know, she ties him up and says, the Philistines are upon you. Now, this should have been his first clue, something off about Delilah, right? This should be his first clue. But sometimes in relationships, and this is not what this message is about, sometimes in relationships we just want to ignore all the red flags, don't we? In order to make a person work, in order to make that relationship fit, we will make all kinds of excuses. Oh, she only wanted to tie me up because of... Oh, she just wanted to trust, you know, trust me because she has trust issues. Everybody in her past has, has betrayed her, has broken her trust, and it's going to take some time for her to really trust me. He probably came up with a lot of excuses. But then she comes to him again and says, Sweetie, you've made a fool of me. This is in verse 10. You lied to me. Come now. Tell me how you can be tied. He said, if anyone ties me securely with new ropes that have never been used, I'll become as weak as any other man. So Delilah took new ropes and tied him with them. Then with the men hidden in the room, she called to him, Samson, the Philistines are upon you. But he snapped the ropes off his arms as if they were threats. Delilah then said to Samson all this time, you have been making a fool of me and lying to me. Tell me how you can be tied. You know, there's, there's a lot of energy about tying him up. A lot of energy about making him weak. A lot of energy about emasculating this man. We have to be careful. We have to be careful. We have to be careful when we match up with people that they are not trying to diffuse your gifts. That they are not trying to diminish who God has called you to be. Some people can be attracted to the spiritual gifts in you, and then once they get with you, they want to control them and subdue them. Anybody been around folk like that? Oh, you're so funny and so charming. Oh, you make me laugh. And then when you're with that person, oh, you're just so charming and funny. You just want to make everybody laugh. How'd that change? Right? Oh, you're so thoughtful and you're so sweet and you're so hospitable. You're so compassionate. Oh, you just warm my heart. I want to spend the rest of my life with you. And then it turns into, oh, you just have to be so hospitable, so compassionate, have to help everybody out. Well, what about me? There are people when they get close enough to you, that will want to diminish your gifts. And they'll want to diminish your gifts because they feel a certain way about themselves in the presence of your light. You need to be careful who is around you. You need to be very observant of who you bring close into your camp. You want to be around people that encourage the gifts that God has blessed you, that are praying for those gifts, that are feeding into those gifts that are helping develop those gifts in you. Not intimidated, not jealous, not fearful, not afraid, but supportive. Are you guys listening? All right, that's just for some relationship stuff. That's not, that's not what this is about though. Let's continue on. She says, you've been embarrassing me. You've been, you've been humiliating me. And so he says, all right, all right, my bad, my bad. If you weave the seven braids of my head into the fabric of, on, on, on loom and tighten it with the pin, I'll become as weak as any other man. 
So while he was sleeping, Delilah took the seven braids of his head, wove them into the fabric, and tightened it with a pin. I don't know how this man could be sleeping that heavily. He must have another spiritual gift. How many parents, how about how many new parents out there wish they had this spiritual gift to just to sleep through all this, right? And, and shout out to some of our new parents, right? All right, the Daly family, they just, they just gave birth to a little precious baby girl. Oh, we're thinking of you, Christina and Matt. We miss you, but we're thinking of you, praying for you. Call us when you can't get any sleep. So, by the way, I love that part as a new parent. I know some of you guys don't. Every time Nathan would cry in the middle of the night, I would spring up. I mean, literally, I'm not bragging. I'm just, this is just, I was so happy. Every time I heard him crying in the middle of the night, I'd wake up and go, I'm a daddy. Really, I'd go, I'm a daddy, I'm a daddy. It, it took a while before that got old, but I'm just letting you know, I was, I was riding that high for a while. I think it was around two years old. I was like, boy, sleep through the night, please. So she does all this, right? She's, you know, she's, she's working on his hair and, you know, she's doing all this stuff. And then she says, the Philistines are upon you. He woke up from his sleep and pulled up, pulled up the pin and the loom with the fabric. Then, then she said to him, how can you say I love you? Oh, my goodness. Doesn't this sound so modern? How can you say I love you when you won't confide in me? This is the third time you've made a fool of me and haven't told me the secret of your great strength. With such nagging, with such nagging, with such nagging, <laughs> she prodded him day after day until he was sick to death of it. Nagging works. <laughs> nagging can make you want to kill yourself. Nagging will make you wish you could die. She nagged the strongest man on the planet to death. Can I say something? Samson's weakness is not his hair being cut off. Samson's weakness is nagging. It worked the first time with his fiance. It works now. Let me tell you something, the enemy knows your weakness. And if it ain't broke, he ain't gonna fix it. And you're wondering why you keep making the same mistakes, falling into the same traps, and he's like, you ain't any different. I know how to work with you. I know your condition. I know that you're a pleaser. I know that you're codependent. I know that you're insecure. I know that you're angry, and I'm just going to work on that stuff and get the results that I want. He's nagged to death. That is his kryptonite. Nagged to death. So finally he gives in and says, all right, all right, all right, woman. So he told her everything. No razor has ever been used on my head. Because I have been a Nazarite dedicated to God from my mother's womb. If my head were shaved, my strength would leave, and I would become as weak as any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her everything, and how did she know that he had told her everything? She probably had my man in tears. He was crying. She had never seen him cry before. She's like, oh. Oh, he, he just let it all out. Okay, this, this is for real. She sends out her text messages, group text. Hey, 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 I got him now. I practically nagged him to death. This is going to work. So while he's asleep, she then has the Philistines come in, and they gave her the silver, and putting him to sleep on her lap, she called for someone to shave off his seven braids, and so began to subdue him, and his strength left him. Then she called Samson. The Philistines are upon you. She called Samson. The Philistines are upon you. He woke up from his sleep and thought, I'll go out as before and shake myself free. But he did not know that the Lord had left him. So I want to unpack this a little bit. 
We're never told to this point that Samson's strength comes from his long hair, are we? Now you'll say, but he was dedicated as a Nazarite. Yes, he was, but there were several things he was not to do as a Nazarite. And again, a number of things he was not to do just as an Israelite keeping the Torah. So we already know from the story up to this point, there are a number of things that Samson does to break his Nazarite vows. Now some may want to argue that yes, he can walk through a vineyard, it's no problem, he most likely didn't take any grapes. Some could argue that even though during his wedding ceremony that was lasting an entire week, where they would have, you know, a, a, a feast of drinking and eating all kinds of foods they weren't allowed to eat, that Samson probably did not partake in those foods or beverages. Yes, it's possible. Someone could argue, yes, he did touch the dead carcass of a lion, but it wasn't the dead carcass of a human being, so maybe he did not break his vow. But everything in the story up to this point has let us know that Samson has been willing to break away from the way he was raised in order to satiate his anger and his need for vengeance. Now, yes, the Bible tells us that the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson, but I'm going to tell you the author has no other way of communicating it. The author of the book of Judges just knows that when Samson does big things, strong things, it must be by the Spirit of God. But according to Samson's own mind, his lips, he says to us that I have always had this strength and it will leave me. It will leave me if I were to break my Nazarite vow by cutting my hair. Now, I just want to ask you a question. Why do you think he's fixated on the symbol of not cutting his hair? Because we're told in the book of Judges that it was simply a symbol of his strength and his commitment, right? It was a symbol of his, of his covenant, just like it was when we read in the Torah. Why do you think of all of the commandments he was to keep that this one was the one? Why do you think? Many of us put our faith in symbols. Just like for us as Seventh-day Adventists, the one commandment that we really hold true to and we think that identifies us and sets us apart is which commandment? The Sabbath, right? The fourth commandment. Now, we might break other commandments in those ten, but we are going to hold true to that fourth one because this is the one that really sets us apart. I would argue with you that keeping the commandments of God, those ten commandments are just ten of hundreds. In the, in the Bible, every time God speaks about the law, he's speaking about the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Every time Paul talks about the law, anytime Paul talks about circumcision, he's not just talking about the act of circumcision. He's talking about circumcision and it being a euphemism for keeping the law. Even in this, in this narrative, when, when Samson says, oh, Lord, don't let me fall into the hands of the uncircumcised, he's not calling out the Philistines just for the fact that they're not circumcised. He's saying, don't let me fall into the hands of people who do not honor you as the true God, who do not keep your commandments, who are not your people, who are not of the line of Abraham. Uncircumcised is just a way of describing, in totality, people who do not keep the law. So why is it that Samson zeroes in on this one commandment to not cut his hair as being the true source of his strength? Is it the source of his strength, family? Is his hair the source of his strength? Is Sabbath keeping the source of your strength? Is not lying or stealing or not murdering the source of your strength? Is coming to church the source of your strength? Is being baptized the source of your strength? Taking part in communion, is it the source of your strength? Is your allegiance and obedience to God, your fidelity to God, is that the source of your strength? I'll ask you one better. Is your obedience the reason why God gives you spiritual gifts? In fact, the reason why they're called spiritual gifts 
is because you cannot earn them. God blesses people with his spirit and the spiritual gifts that come with it as an act of grace. Samson did nothing to earn the spiritual gift. When God sends a messenger to talk to Samson's mother, Samson hasn't, he hasn't even been conceived yet. But there's already a gift waiting for him at the, at the desk. This is why the disciples in, Ma- in Acts chapter 15 have to argue with those Judaizers and say, clearly, clearly, these people don't have to be circumcised because God has already shown that he's approved of them, that he's accepted them by giving them the Holy Spirit before they were circumcised. So circumcision cannot be a prerequisite for the Holy Spirit since God has already bestowed this upon some of these Romans, these Gentiles. And this is really important for us to note because often we feel that we're in good standing with God because of all the things that we do. Reading the story of Samson is such a challenge to us because he's disobedient at every single turn. Now, watch this. He tries to break these, 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 these ropes now. He, he's been bound. He tries to break them and fight the Philistines, and he can't. And the author says, because God has left him. Up to this point, the author is convinced that every single time Samson uses his strength, that the Spirit of God is empowering him. The Spirit of God came upon him. The Spirit of God was moving him. The Spirit of God was inspiring him to do this. The Spirit of God, the Spirit of God. And now he can't do it. Well, he doesn't have a Spirit of God anymore. God has left him. God left him. God God has had enough. He went to supercuts. Last straw. Not the wine. Not the murdering. Not the hateful, vengeful acts of Samson. Nope, nope. Supercuts. You go to supercuts. You're done. On the Sabbath, you're done. I think the author doesn't know how to describe what's happening before him. Now, I challenged you last week in saying that the the, the way Scripture is put together is not that every word is inspired. It is the author who's inspired. The Holy Spirit moves upon men. And they, under inspiration, they write. But we, as Seventh-day Adventists, we don't believe in word inspiration. We believe in thought inspiration. So when we're reading Scripture, we have to sometimes step back and say, okay, 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 okay. I know what it says, but what is the thought that is being communicated right now? We must understand the thought. The words might get in the way. Anybody ever been in a situation, communication-wise, where words get in the way? But you said, I know what I said, I know what I said but this is what I meant. But you said, screenshot, highlight, right there, this is the word you used. I get it. I used the wrong word. It's not what I was trying to communicate. Anybody ever been there before? Anybody? Okay, sometimes words get in the way. And especially when you start dealing with translations, even more so. So what we're looking at in Scripture, but we know from, this, from what we know so far in this narrative, is that Samson no longer has the power to overcome his enemies. And why is that? Has God left him? Has God left? Well, Scripture says God had left him. Has God left him? Does God no longer love him? Has he cut Samson off? Is Samson too bad for God to use now? Let's keep reading. Time has come to a has passed and the Philistines are celebrating, they're worshiping, and they want to humiliate Samson. The Bible tells us that they gouged out his eyes in chapter 16, verses 21 and 22. They gouged out his eyes and took him down to Gaza, binding him with bronze shackles. They set him to a grinding grain in in the prison but the hair on his head began to grow after it had been shaved. Why does the author say that? Why does the author make note that his hair starts to grow? 
When you read that, what are you thinking? His hair is growing, so what else must be growing? His strength, right? Because that's the secret. The secret sauce is his hair, right? Now, if the Philistines know this, are they going to let him grow an afro out again? Probably not, right? All right, so his hair begins to grow back. The author wants us to understand that. Verse 23, now the rulers of the Philistines assembled to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and to celebrate, saying, our God has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hands. When the people saw them, they praised their God, saying, our God has delivered our enemy into our hands. The one who laid waste to our land and multiplied our slain, while they were in high spirits, in other words, drunk, they shouted, bring out Samson to entertain us. So they called Samson out of prison and performed for them. When they stood him among the, the pillars, Samson said to the servant who held his hand, put me where I can feel the pillars that support the temple so I may lean against them. Now the temple was crowded, verse 27, with men and women. All the rulers of the Philistines were there and on the roof were about 3,000 3, men and women watching Samson perform. Then Samson prayed to the Lord, Sovereign Lord, remember me. Remember me. Samson, had God forgotten you? Do you think God had forgotten Samson at this point? Sovereign Lord, remember me. Please, God, strengthen me just once more. Pause. His hair has not grown back. It was starting to grow back, but it surely wasn't as long as it used to be, right? There's no way he could be as strong as he used to be if his strength comes from his hair. But he says, strengthen me once more. Who was he asking to strengthen him? Where did his strength come from? God. It never came from his hair. Pastor, then why did his strength leave him? Because Samson believed for a time that it did. And this is the problem we have, family. We have put more faith in our symbols than we do in the God the symbols point us to. We have put more time, more investment, more passion, more fervor, more commitment in our symbols and we'll argue about our symbols. We will wrestle with one another about our symbols and what they mean and what they should be. And, and if we're not doing this, then in the end we'll be lost. If we're not doing this, then God cannot bless us. I'm telling you right now, there are blessings that come from God that have nothing to do with our obedience. You wanna know why? Because they're gifts. They're just gifts. They're gifts. I reign on the just and the unjust. They're just gifts. They are gifts. That is why there are people that have not shown up at church ever and still find blessings. And some of you right now are thinking, then why go to church, pastor? Ah, because that's why you were in this all along. Then why be faithful, pastor, if we're going to be blessed no matter what? Because that's the reason why you wanted to be faithful. Our obedience and our faithfulness for most of us is because we want something. And we'll manipulate and we'll control in order to get what we want. Samson now is at the point where he is so humbled and he has nothing to offer God, nothing to offer God. So he must pray and say, Lord, remember me. And just this once more. Give me back my strength. Why, Samson? Because it comes from you. I don't earn it. I don't deserve it. I have lived a life that has been outside of harmony of your will in so many situations. But once more, be gracious unto me. Does Samson deserve it right now? Does Samson deserve it? Watch this. Not only does Samson not deserve for God to give him strength, Samson's reason is still backwards. Watch this. 
Lord, give me back my strength this once more and let me with one blow get revenge on the Philistines for my two eyes. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. We talked about this. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Is that fair? Absolutely. So Samson, they took out your two eyes, find one Philistine, take out his two eyes, and we're even, right? Samson wants to kill 3,000 people right now. 3,000 Philistines because of his two eyes. Samson has never been fair. Samson has always, 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 when he wanted revenge, always, when he wanted vengeance, always wanted to do more. It was never an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. It was always, I'm going to make you hurt, and you are going to suffer for humiliating me. Now, here, watch this. It might have been more righteous had he said, Lord, let me take out your enemies, the ones who have tormented us, the ones who have abused your people, the ones who have not been compassionate, the ones that you have lingered with for long enough, the ones who are desecrating your name right now, the ones who are lifting up a demonic demon, and Lord, right now may your name be proclaimed throughout the earth. No, they stole my lunch money. They're going to get it. Not even in this moment does Samson exemplify a heart of repentance. So the answer should be no. Absolutely not. I'm sorry, son. You are going to be humiliated some more until you learn your lesson, but that's not what happens. The Bible says, that Samson reached toward the two central pillars on which the temple stood, bracing himself against them, his right hand on the one and the left on the other. Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. Then he pushed with all his might, and down came the temple on the rulers and all the people in it. Thus he killed many more when he died than when he lived. Then his brothers and his father's whole family, they came down, they got his body, they buried him. And it says that Samson led Israel for 20 years. Now you're going to say to me, Pastor, God gave him that strength. Clearly what God wanted to happen, happened just as he wanted it to happen. I want you to look at the very last verse, the very last verse in the book of Judges. The very last verse in the book of Judges. Turn there with me. Chapter 21, verse 25. This is really important. Because this gives us context to everything we find in the most bloody book in the Bible. All war, all blood, and God seemingly a part of all of it. In fact, the, the, the story right after Samson is one of the most grotesque stories in all of Scripture. It'll make you angry. What, is the, what does the verse say? In those days there was what? No king in Israel. They still had the Torah. They still had a priest. But there was no king in Israel, and every man, not some, not a few, not just the evil men, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That is how the book of Judges ends. If you want to have context for why all of this stuff happens the way it happens, it's because every man is judging based on what's right in their own eyes. Samson. And at this point, he doesn't even have any eyes. And yet, it is his judgment that this is what the Philistines deserve for what they did to his eyes. So what's the point? Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 and 34. Hebrews chapter 11, verses 32 through 34, it says... And what more shall I say? The author has gone through this list of faithful actions from many different women and men in the Old Testament and how that through faith, through faith, they have been overcomers. He says, and what shall I say? What more shall I say? I do not have time to tell about Gideon or Barak or Samson. By the way, these are all characters in the book of Judges. I know why he didn't want to touch on Judges. He left that book alone pretty much. He said, I don't have time to talk about it. He probably just didn't have time to explain all of it, but that's fine. But watch what he says. 
I don't have time to talk about Gideon and Samson and Jephthah, I, I, about David and Samuel in First and Second Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, and gained what was promised, who shut the mouths of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness, oh, there we go, whose weakness was turned to strength. Ah, there we go. There we go. That's what I was looking for. What does Paul say? It is when I am weak that I am So many times, family, myself included, I have judged myself in my weakness. I have looked at the weakest parts, weakest times in my life and said, oh, John, you're not deserving. Oh, Jonathan, if people only knew. Oh, I can't believe you would do this again. And I want to judge myself. I want to, I want to condemn myself. And I want to say, Lord, I'm not deserving of your love. I'm not deserving of your gifts, Lord. I, I, just cut me off. Lord, you should leave me now. And God says, now, when you're at your weakest, now, when you need me the most, now you want me to leave you? Yes, Lord, leave me now, leave me now. I ironed my clothes on the Sabbath. I don't deserve you. I don't deserve you, Lord. I failed again. I allowed my anger to overwhelm me. I should not have said that. I should not have done that. Lord, I, I, I'm, I'm done. Cut me off. Now? Yes, now, Lord. There's other people that are far more deserving. Waste your grace and your gifts and your spirit on people like them. The hall of faith is full of people who are weak. Really weak. And the only way they overcome is because God is strong in our weakness. The story of Samson is not how to live your life. The best, the, the, the four-point plan that Samson uses to be an overcomer. No, there is no plan in Samson's life. He's a hedonist. He goes with his feelings. He's driven by his emotions. He does what he wants to do. And in the end, he still doesn't get it right. But guess who gets it right for him? Jesus. Family, when we understand that there is nothing that we do that makes us worthy of what God gives us, this is when life can finally be lived in a healthy way. It is when we can finally be disciples that are non-judgmental and we can love on people the way God has called us to love on people. We're closing right now. Galatians. Galatians. Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 through 6. Galatians chapter 5, verses 2 through 6. Paul says this, mark my words. Mark my words. Tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, he's talking about those who keep in the law, Christ will be of no value at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Listen to what he's saying. He's saying in your insistence on keeping all of the law, you have alienated yourself from Christ. You have fallen away from grace because you're not dependent on grace. You're dependent on obedience and the law. For through the Spirit, we eagerly wait by faith the righteousness of for which we hope. By what? By faith. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. Oh, you got to get this. Neither circumcision or uncircumcision. Let me say it in layman's words. Neither obedience or disobedience. that at the foot of the cross, everything has lost its value that we thought made us righteous and right with God. And 
we realize that everything that makes us right with God is the one on the cross. It's the one nailed to the tree. The reason why Samson's story can be included in the hall of faith isn't because of Samson, it's because of Jesus. The only reason, no, 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 don't miss the point here. Don't miss the point. God's grace for Samson is the same grace that is applied to all the Philistines who died in that temple. Not them. No, 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 not them, pastor, because they were worshiping a false god. Samson, I don't know which god he was worshiping. Let me take vengeance, Lord. Vengeance is mine, Lord. Oh, Samson. Oh, my precious boy, Samson, you still don't get it. This is how you want to judge? Look what they did to my eyes. I know. Look what they did to my hands and my feet and my head. They did all of this to me. Well, then get them back, Jesus. No, Samson. I don't want to get them back. Not in the way you want me to get them back. I want to get them back by returning them back to me. Those are my babies too. Oh, if the works that had been done here been done in Sodom, they would have repented long ago. Those are Jesus' words. If the works that had been done here had been done in Philistia, Christ could apply that to every wicked city, every wicked situation. If the works that had been done here, been done there, they would have repented long ago. You're going to be surprised at the end of time. Who is saved? We don't know. But pastor, if we look at their actions, we'll know. If we look at their actions, Samson is lost. If we look at their actions, David is lost. Solomon is lost. David's last act on his deathbed was embarrassing. He also wanted to take revenge. It was not the spirit of God. We got to call out evil, and Jesus calls out evil at Calvary. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. The book of Judges is a book of vengeance and violence, and God allows us to see where it all leads. He allows us to see how bad sin gets. And hopefully, hopefully, even through failures, we'll still learn. Even through the bloodshed, we'll still learn. I hope we can learn lessons in what's happening in Gaza right now. But I want to learn things the easy way, not the hard way, not the violent way. Samson, I wish that you could have overturned everyone in there by an act of grace that would have converted hearts. Because I'm going to tell you something. Jesus did overthrow the Roman Empire just not in the way that you thought. He did it by his grace. He did it through his disciples. He did it through martyrdom. People who were abused violently, paraded through the Colosseum. And their faith, historians say, their blood became like seeds. And we're here today because someone in the Colosseum in the exact same situation Samson was in, did not pray for vengeance. They prayed for forgiveness. And someone watching on, as children were being torn to shreds by lions, someone watching on said, those people are different. They're different. We got the wrong person. There's something to this faith of theirs. Their blood became seeds. Family, are you willing for your actions to become seeds? The Holy Spirit in Galatians chapter 5, the fruits of the Spirit are what? Long-suffering, patience, love, joy, peace. Are you ready for your seeds even in the midst of violence and disrespect and emasculation? Are you willing as your partner has nagged you almost to death, are you willing for what you do in response to become seeds of grace? As the priest team comes forward, 
our take home lesson in all that we have seen in this book, in this narrative of, of, of Samson. It's not about how bad Samson is. There's lessons to learn from that. But our take home will always be how good God is in the face of all evil. And that whatever God is doing to save Samson, he's doing to save the Philistines as well. Whatever God is doing to save you, he's doing to save the one who walked out on you. Whatever God is doing to forgive you and to restore you, he's doing that for your enemies as well. He's for Israel. He's for the Palestinians. He's for the Ukrainians. He's for the Russians. He's for Whose side are you on, God? Neither, Joshua. Neither. Neither. I'm on the side of redeeming this planet, and it starts with you. Do you want to be a part of that? This happens as we open our hearts to the Holy Spirit, and we let him transform us. Father God, we thank you so much for what you have done in this place. There are hearts that have been healed, been convicted by your Holy Spirit. We've been able to look at the ugliness of humanity in the Samson story, and we don't want any part of that. We don't want that to be how our narrative is. Father, we thank you that your grace does impact us even with our missed decisions at the end of our life. But we, we want your Holy Spirit right now. We want to experience a turnaround right now, not our final act, right now. Families that need to be restored, friendships that need to be restored, enemies that no longer need to be our enemies because of your grace and because what you are calling us to do. May your Holy Spirit fill this place, fill our hearts, that we have a healthy home here, a healthy environment, a healthy church, that anybody who comes here can feel it and experience it. So, Father, I thank you for those who have stood, those who are making a recommitment to you. Holy Spirit, be our guide, not our emotions, not our passions. You, Holy Spirit, be the only symbol that we feel fidelity towards, not our obedience, not these external things. But you, Holy Spirit, you are our leader. And may these symbols only point us to a deeper, more intimate, more personal, and more trusting relationship with Jesus. We ask all these things in your name, Lord. Let everyone say amen and amen and amen. God bless you, church family. God bless you. God bless you.